I think I always kind of start that conversation with the fact that I think a lot of people don't really know about Bangladesh. Or if they do, they, they often have the idea of the old Bangladesh, um, you know, one of the poorest countries in the world, you know, uh, dense, uh, crowded, maybe more recently, it's, it's cyclones and sweatshops and refugees. Like that's kind of what's ingrained within their, their minds when, let's say, the average Westerner or the average person, you know, any global citizen maybe might think about Bangladesh. I think, you know, where I'm really excited about is I think, you know, today we're kind of building and have been building the new Bangladesh, right? Uh, Nirjor, how are you? It's a pleasure to meet you today. Likewise, Burak, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I've always enjoyed your insights um, in, in the calls we've been together. So it's, and, you know, love your emails as well. So it's always a pleasure uh, to connect with you. And it's awesome to do this in this format. I know uh, a little bit about your background. Uh, you lived in Bangladesh, Japan, US, Mongolia. So should you share your uh, global experiences shaped your perspective before we deep delve about the entrepreneurs, startups and Bangladesh ecosystem? Yeah, sure. Th thanks a lot for that. And so my background, I was born in Bangladesh, but um, as a young child, we moved to the state uh, to Japan for my father to get his education, and then we moved to the states uh, when I was in elementary school, and that's kind of where I grew up. And then since then, you know, I got to travel the world a little bit and worked in a few countries, including in Kenya, including in Mongolia, and obviously, you know, it brought me back to Bangladesh, you know, where I was born, uh, and I've been working in the country for the last ten years plus. Um, I think it's it's a couple of things you take away, right? So so one is I think. Uh, being an immigrant, being somebody who's, you know, in a, has to kind of establish himself in a new place. Um, I think that's also, ultimately, it is a little bit like being a founder, right? You don't have a lot in the way of resources, but you have to kind of establish yourself. You have to go out and meet people. You have to kind of create those resources and opportunities for yourself. I've learned a lot of that through my parents. You know, I think in many ways, they are the heroes of my life. Uh, and also myself, right? Being a, a young person, you know, trying to make their way. The second is, I think, you know, you develop, um, I think I ascribe to the notion and I think this is where a lot of entrepreneurs around the world that we work with, I think, also believe in, which is, you know, opportunity or talent is evenly distributed, but maybe opportunity isn't. Uh, because I have met people just as talented in, in Mongolia, in Kenya, and in Bangladesh as I've met in places like Texas and Washington, D.C. and other places I've been privileged enough to live. It's just that maybe that sometimes they don't always get those opportunities. And I think that's where I really believe in the power of uh, tech and entrepreneurship. Uh, and hopefully the flows of capital to be able to democratize some of that. Uh, so that's something, you know, that's that's something that gives me a lot of joy on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of doing what we do. Were you always interested in um, startups, business, and entrepreneurship from young age? How did you get into this field? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it was something I kind of fell into. So first, you know, I, I was interested in kind of business as a means to, what I really liked was, I think, the the idea that every business is kind of its own orga or organism. Right, you are kind of bringing together ideas and people and processes in a way that hopefully the world finds valuable. I've always been kind of intrigued by that idea, and then you know, as I grew older, uh, I think I realized that you know the best place for someone like me or where I thrive is in environments where maybe that's in the early stage. You know, where you're, you're trying to create companies or you're trying to help early stage companies. So it was very much an evolution. I think into kind of where I am doing now, you know, I was, uh, I was a management consultant. It was then a, uh, you know, I was in working for a family office. Uh, then I became a social entrepreneur in Bangladesh. And then I became an accelerator manager and then got to, got, which kind of got me into what I'm doing today, which is I'm running an angel network. And I guess I'm, you know, part of the industry that kind of allocates capital towards entrepreneurs. What have been the most biggest lessons you have learned from diverse prof professional experience so far? Yeah, I think it's the fact that, um, you know, you don't always have to be an expert in something, right? Um, but then you can, I think, in fact, you know, taking fresh eyes and, and, and trying, to, uh, trying to kind of bring that perspective, I think, can be quite valuable. Uh, so one example is, you know, when I went back to Bangladesh 10 years ago, uh, it was with a project funded by the Gates Foundation with a UK-based NGO that basically said, look, you know, can you create an, uh, a sanitation business from scratch in Bangladesh? And I didn't know anything about toilets. I didn't know anything about sanitation. I didn't know anything about fecal sludge. But I was lucky enough to, you know, help create a team that, you know, and, and the particular business now is in 30 cities in Bangladesh, right? And so that kind of made me realize like, okay, 
you know, these skills are actually quite fungible. Business building, price building, organization building, people building, right? It doesn't really matter what you're selling, whether it's ice cream or laptops or a podcast platform or even capital, right? I think a lot of those lessons are quite similar. And if anything, I think every iteration has just kind of given me more insight into how to do those things better. Let's come to the Bangladesh startup ecosystem. How would you describe the current startup ecosystem in Bangladesh? What are some of the key strengths and weaknesses? I think I always kind of start that conversation with the fact that I think a lot of people don't really know about Bangladesh. Or if they do, they, they often have the idea of the old Bangladesh, um, you know, one of the poorest countries in the world, you know, uh, dense, uh, crowded, maybe more recently, it's, it's cyclones and sweatshops and refugees. Like that's kind of what's ingrained within their, their minds when, let's say, the average Westerner or the average person, you know, any global citizen maybe might think about Bangladesh. I think, you know, where I'm really excited about is I think, you know, today we're kind of building and have been building the new Bangladesh, right? Uh, and it's not just me, it's, it's so many people in the country. Um, if you can imagine a country, you know, obviously you're in uh, Istanbul and Turkey, you know, it's, it's a country that's, I think, one twelfth the size of Turkey but it's got double the population, right? Uh, it's 160 million people. Hakka is one of the most densely populated countries in the world, but it's extremely young. You know, the average age is 28 years old. Uh, you have a very young population, but, you know, I'm always very much surprised by how the fact that, you know, people learn to speak English at a young age. They're often socialized into, you know, watching, you know, all the, you know, things, you know, Netflix and K-pop and, and, and those things. So they, they have a very global outlook. And I think that's a good place to start. Uh, you have, you know, one of the, uh, you know, you have an internet population that's like 100 million people. That's already bigger than most countries. It's got a higher per capita GDP compared to countries like India and Pakistan, which are the two countries they became independent from. You have some really great um, sources of talent. You know, it's, uh, it's one of the fastest growing uh, countries in the world for online freelancers, right? Uh, you know, young people kind of making their own way through those platforms. It's got a, one of the largest uh, apparel manufacturing sectors in the world. It's got a, a you know, a large pharmaceutical uh, industry as well in, in generics. It's got, you know, millions of Bangladeshis living abroad and sending money back home, which is contributing to consumption. So I think the macro story is quite good, right? I think that's maybe the first place to start. So then if you, if you, if you take that as a foundation, I think what's exciting about the startup sector is you have the opportunity to kind of serve this growing middle class with digitally enabled services and products that hopefully uh, create what might be, one might call consumer surplus. That was something I learned from one of my friends, Joe Merrill, who runs Sputnik Accelerator and VC in Austin, where, you know, just imagine, right? Dhaka is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Just to go in to see a doctor might end up being two hours of your day in traffic. But if that doctor can come to your house, right, or if that doctor can come through you, come to you through your screen, that creates a lot of consumer surplus, right? That saves time, that saves money, that saves effort. So I think that's, you know, to me, very exciting is a lot of entrepreneurs and the most successful entrepreneurs are very much kind of creating products and services for this growing affluent class, middle class, but also those who aspire to get into that class in a country like Bangladesh. Uh, and I think the smartphones are, you know, very much kind of enabling that as we speak. What changes have you observed in the ecosystem over the last five to 10 years? Right. But then you kind of go beyond that into like the, you know, first order into second and third order kind of uh, opportunities and platforms and industry. You got, you know, various unicorns uh, and companies building uh, things for e-commerce and healthcare and logistics and, and fintech and agritech, right? Uh, so I think one is just, a, yeah, the quantum of capital, the, the growth of these companies in terms of valuation, size and scale, they are now household names. Uh, that wasn't the case before. I think there's also a shift in culture. You know, maybe 10 years ago when I first went back to Bangladesh, you know, if you wanted, if you were an ambitious Bangladeshi person, you know, you kind of had three options. You know, you could work for a multinational company in Bangladesh. You could go abroad and, and, and do that. Or maybe you work in the NGO sector. Right? Because once again, it used to be a poor country, so that employed a lot of people in the middle class. But then nowadays, you know, that, that's, that third leg is kind of gone. But then what's replaced is a lot of young people aspire to be startup entrepreneurs because they've seen people come from nowhere, you know, not always from, let's say, the most connected backgrounds, but being able to build these amazing companies that in turn, you know, uh, have hired hundreds of people, thousands of people, have solved problems for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions of people. So I think that culture has shifted quite a bit as well. Uh, both on the consumer side and obviously from the standpoint of talent. Uh, so I think those are some of the changes I've seen. 
uh, when it comes to uh, the ecosystem. And maybe one third thing I would say, you know, that we are also part of this, you know, we have tried to help with this, which is we have seen a more kind of shift even amongst capital allocators, whether it's family offices, conglomerates, financial institutions, local high net worth people, as well as the diaspora to say, okay, you know, this is interesting. We'd like to be a part of this. We'd like to invest in these entrepreneurs and we will not invest in a way that's kind of exploitative, which was sometimes the case when we, you know, for, because there was a mismatch, right? Between what entrepreneurs are seeking and they didn't have access to risk capital versus those who had the capital. And I think that that equilibrium has shifted quite a bit too. Um, and I think that's also quite healthy. So those are some of the things we've seen uh, over the last 10 years that I've been in the, on the ground and about the five years that I've kind of uh, been in charge of Bangladesh Angels. Where do you see the biggest opportunities for startups and entrepreneurs in Bangladesh right now? I think there's so many problems, you know, so many challenges, so many transaction costs to daily life in Bangladesh. You know, I think there's so much opportunity, like I said, 160 million people I met, but, you know, you have bank account penetration rates that are, you know, not optimal, credit card penetration rates that are less than, I think, one or 2%. Just imagine being able to put more capital in the hands of both consumers and entrepreneurs, right? And recently we've done a transaction. It's one of the first companies that will become, uh, that got one of the first digital banking licenses in the country. So we're very excited to kind of see the growth of this sector. And I think there will be many more in the future, right? Just, yeah, that's that's one opportunity. I think there's still so much to be done in education, right? Um, it's still very much kind of analog, you know, how one gets educated within Bangladesh, um, being, you know, I think there's a lot of ed techs kind of in that space, but also the financing education, uh, you know, even facilitating how one goes abroad and gets educated or gain technical skills. I think that's that's interesting as well. Um, even just, you know, big sectors like agriculture, you know, agriculture represents around, I don't know, maybe less than 20 percent of GDP, but employs, I think, around 30, 40 percent of the population. So there's clearly a productivity gap there. Right. And so there's a lot to be learned, I think, from other markets like India and in Indonesia and others that are you know, helping to kind of organize their agriculture value chains, uh, especially as the country grows and you have less people on the countryside. They want to come to the city. They want to be consumers. They want to be middle class. They want to be professionals. Right. Um, so there's so many. And I think that's where I'm eager to engage with people like you is we want to learn from countries that are maybe 10 years ahead of us, five to 10 years ahead of us and say, OK, well, what's worked for them? What hasn't worked for them? What kind of companies do they have? Should they exist in Bangladesh? And hopefully bring some of those ideas to the country. If you compare the ecosystem with other countries, such as Southeast Asia, like India, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, what can you learn from these ecosystems in the region? I think, you know, one major differentiator, right, between a lot of these ecosystems that you mentioned compared to Bangladesh is that on a per capita basis, on a per annum basis, the amount of venture capital invested in the country is like literally cents on the dollar, right? You know, India is like a you know, few dollars, whereas Bangladesh is literally like cents on the dollar, right? And so what that means is I think that stifles innovation because not enough capital is going into new entrepreneurs, not enough capital is going into uh, new ideas, right? Uh, and, and so I think that's one lesson. And I think a lot of people, particularly when you talk to foreign investors, international investors who have been investing the majority of the money into the start startup ecosystem in Bangladesh. And they all, I think one gentleman just told me straight up, like, it's not even a branding issue. Or, or it's not that you have a bad brand, you just have no brand, right? I think I think we have struggled and maybe we haven't always been as proactive in the recent years in getting our story out there, that there's this amazing economic miracle that's happening in Bangladesh and you should take a look at it and you should work with us to help facilitate it and you could potentially reap the rewards of it. Uh, so I think we haven't done enough of that. Uh, and, and hence, you know, we have to go out and do more of that and we have to engage with the world that maybe in the past we haven't done as much of. So I think that's one thing we ha that has to change, you know, and, and those are the lessons we need to take from some of those ecosystems because a lot of those ingredients are there. Great entrepreneurs, big opportunities, big markets, growing populations, growing incomes, all those things are there. It's just that maybe the, uh, the investment just hasn't been as forthcoming uh, in our country in the past, as in, in the past at least. How much interest and activity are you seeing from regional and global investors in Bangladesh startups? I think they're very open. That maybe wasn't the case or maybe I feel like particularly the last two, three, four years, you know, even just now, like, you know, even today, like I've had a couple of conversations like this this week. I've had a couple of conversations like this, right? This month, I've had quite a few conversations like this. I think, you know, capital is so fungible now. 
and people understand the opportunity in Asia. And I think people are starting to come around and understand the opportunity in a place like Bangladesh. And so they're very curious. I think where the gap is, is, okay, maybe there aren't enough what they might call investable companies, or maybe they need a little bit more local capital and a bit more execution be before they're ready for large quantities of capital from some of these international investors, right? And that's the role of kind of local ecosystem leaders like us to say, okay, maybe this is what we need to work on, you know, with such and such entrepreneur, or this is kind of, this is what might get you more investable, or this is the story you need to tell about your particular company, right? I think those are, like, I think the execution, the opportunity is there, the interest is there. I think matching that with execution is still something we're working on. What's your point, opinion about the um, unique cultural challenges for entrepreneurs and investors in Bangladesh? Because the culture is different from the global perspective or even regional ones. Yeah, um, I think every country has its own kind of cultural nuance, right? Um, even in a place like Bangladesh, for example, I think, um, you know, there's things, you know, one has to be aware of. For example, we're in Ramadan right now. Right, which means business slows down and you just have to be ready for that. You have to prepare for that, right? You have to kind of build that into your business model, so to speak, is that inevitably things are going to slow down, right? Or there's nuances of, you know, even like, I think, for example, we have a remote team and I think a lot of our women uh, staff members have really benefited from that because otherwise, you know, if we had an office first culture, they wouldn't be able to work with us because their, you know, families would feel uncomfortable for them to relocate to Dhaka and, and you know, go and work in an environment all the, uh, you know, with, mostly men or majority men all the time, right? So there's definitely nuances. But I th I'd like to think that, you know, one of the things I really like about the startup sector is that often they're led by people who are in their 30s and early 40s and maybe even late 20s. Uh, they have a very kind of global outlook, you know, whether by way of just what they consume or, you know, having even lived abroad. And so I, I see a lot of really positive environments where, you know, people, there are horizontal organizations, people can speak up, their efforts and uh, ideas are valued, right? Um, and, and just kind of combining the best of both worlds. I think that's something that I really appreciate about the startup sector in terms of allowing that for a lot of young people as an outlet. How can the ecosystem be made uh, more founder and investor friendly? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the 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 best way for to help both is probably liquidity, right? The more mm -hmm. follow-on capital there is, the more exits there are going to be, particularly for early stage investors, which gets them excited and that makes them tell their friends, hey, invest more money into the ecosystem, which helps more entrepreneurs because then they're looking for capital. Right? It's always got these positive knock-on effects. Uh, or externalities, right, that are produced when you just have one or two big exits and, and case studies you can use. Now, we've had exits. It's just that they've been kind of smaller or they've been buyouts, right, in kind of later stage rounds as opposed to like a massive idea to IPO type exit. Um, and I think structurally, I know, I know the government is working on that. There's a government backed VC fund that is looking at, you know, kind of an on ramp for companies to get listed onto the local stock exchange. It'd be great to see in the future, maybe even some M&A between regional players and and Bangladeshi companies. It's happened in Bangladesh, by the way. You know, we were talking about this, right? Where uh, several Turkish firms recently have bought, you know, uh, enterprises in Bangladesh in the consumer space. Because I, I get it, like Muslim majority countries, young populations, density, and all that. What if that happened in the startup sector, for example, right? But if, if there is more follow-on liquidity, I think it, it makes both parties and everybody and, and the lives of people like us easier in terms of facilitating more opportunities. And I think that's something we need to kind of start thinking more. About. Like I think we've been good at kind of that early stage getting capital in. And I think nowadays is like, that's got to be the part of the next evolution in the ecosystem is how do we facilitate more exits uh, in, for, in the ecosystem. What policy or regulatory change would you like to see to support the startups and investments from the government? I think, you know, one thing I really appreciate about certain markets, for example, like the UK is that, uh, you know, there are, and even the US, right, where you have certain tax benefits when you invest early into companies and then you know you're able to kind of potentially take you know tax write-offs on losses or potentially against you know even future capital gains right if you do it in certain ways i think that's important because you know particularly for high net worth they're always thinking about how to kind of minimize their tax uh you know uh, as a means to just be being kind of strategic about that right so i think it, and, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel i think there's uh there's plenty of opportunities uh, to kind of just take lessons, right, from other ecosystems in terms of how they've been able to facilitate that. I think that's that's one. And second, as mentioned, you know, there are certain kind of structural barriers to for companies to get listed. 
uh, into, you know, for example, you have to show profitability, I think for three or five years, uh, I don't know the exact amount, but obviously a startup usually doesn't make money, right? Uh, maybe until the very end when they're ready for an IPO. So that those rules have to be changed, right? Or at least kind of relaxed a little bit uh, when it comes to, you know, follow ons. I think also, yeah, just, you know, would love to see, for example, in Bangladesh, you know, there are already policies in place where banks have to allocate a certain portion of their lending to, for example, the agricultural sector, right? And that allowed the microfinance industry, which is a multi-billion dollar industry in Bangladesh that's also been exported abroad as a model to flourish because banks will lend to microfinance institutions who in turn lend to rural people. Imagine if they could, if part of that could be allocated towards venture capital, whether equity or venture debt, right? So there's definitely a few levers to pull. Uh, but I think these are people, things that a lot of people are working on, including us. Um, so happy to support that. We'd love to kind of see that in the future. In what ways is Bangladesh similar or different from the Silicon Valley mindset about entrepreneurship, of course? Yeah, it's a good question. I think if you speak to a Westerner who's lived in Bangladesh, I think the universal acclaim is that one, Bangladeshis are humble, almost to a fault. Uh, they are very polite uh, and they're very hardworking. I think those are things that they would say right, about Bangladeshis. Uh, and they're entrepreneurial, right? They're always looking for new things to do, new things to create. They're very hungry for, I guess, opportunities, right? Um, I think that's that's something that a lot of you know people would agree with, and and that's something I've kind of learned to be very proud of, uh, you know, as as a Bangladeshi American, uh, which maybe I wasn't so, or I I didn't think about that growing up, right? I think the difference, or a big difference, that's still needing to be kind of resolved, is that. You know, and I think this is also true. I think it, I talked with my team about this, actually. I think it is a certain kind of scarcity mindset, which comes from a society that used to be very poor, which is, hey, you should get a job. You should get a steady income. Uh, you know, go to a place where you can then go up and move up and then you could get a driver and, you know, you could take a couple of vacations a year like that's and you should buy a house. Like that is kind of the the culture that I think a lot of our let's say parents are kind of pushing. And the second and the flip side is then, you know, well, it's great if you want to do entrepreneurship, but what if you fail? And, and I think the biggest difference in the US is so what if you fail? That's wonderful. Like take those lessons and do the next thing, right? Um I think we've yet to really internalize that uh, you know, within the kind of mainstream culture. But I think it's important to kind of keep pushing for that. Uh, because, you know, I, I always tell this also to my team that, you know, whatever you you know, one is doing now, that may not be what ends up being what, you know, your kind of success or call mark, but hallmark, right? But you only need a few shots in life to go in, go through. Like that's the beauty of particularly entrepreneurship, right? Nobody remembers your failures. They just remember your successes, hopefully if you go do it in the right way. Um, and so I think those are some of the things that maybe we still have to build within the culture. So embracing the failure is very difficult especially i know from our own culture so wh what is it is perceived in bangladesh H how does the culture uh faces the failures yeah i think it's um you know i think there's definitely kind of a thread where you know particularly within kind of the middle class to kind of shield your <laughs> you know son or daughter from failure right you want them to take the path of kind of what's proven so entrepreneurship is not proven but being a professional is being a doctor is being an engineer is working in banking is right or working for a corporate is so i think that's something quite frankly i think a lot of people you know even with my own team right uh you know we were kind of discussing this where you know to work in this sector to do kind of what we do it's exciting and you're at the forefront of things but there's not enough kind of examples of success and so you constantly have to explain you know, particularly to your relatives or, you know, at the, particularly at the dinner party, right? That, okay, what do you do? What, what is that? You know, I've never heard of it, uh, et cetera. Like, oh, you know, oh, but don't all startups fail or, you know, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, there's often this shot. It is for, close to unemployment. <laughs> it, is, it is, right? Or, and I, I think there's also a little bit of schadenfreude where, you know, oh, wow, see, I told you like when a company fails, and, but having raised a lot of money or it was in the press and say, oh, you know, look at it. Like, but I think, you know, and it's just, it's just something we have to work on, right? Where I, I remember this because there is a precedent here because the garment industry, the textile manufacturing industry in Bangladesh is huge. And I remember when I first went back 10 years ago and I was just grabbing lunch at a workshop with somebody and he was telling me about a story of, you know, being an employed person working for uh, like a Hong Kong buying house. Then he got the courage to start his own textile factory. 
But and I visited his factory. But then he gave me the further insight that when he was starting his own company, he had a fiance whose parents refused to let her marry him because oh, he's gonna lose he's gonna lose his shirt literally. You know, he's not gonna make it. Um, and then he he lost uh, the fiance, but he kept the business. He became very successful, and he still became friends with her, who ended up marrying a you know a doctor later on, and they're still very friendly. But that tells me something, right? That you know, it's it's really kind of. But nowadays, you know, obviously, like anybody would love to have their daughter or son marry into a textile apparel family because typically that's where a lot of wealth has been created in Bangladesh, right? So it just kind of takes a little bit of time. Like once the industry is established and it's no longer new and people see, you know, wealth generated, I think that attitude changes and probably very quickly. And it's just kind of we're, we're still not there yet, but I think hopefully that will happen. What motivated you to join the Bangladesh Angel Network or did you... Uh, structure it from the scratch. So I did not structure it from scratch. So it was a concept that was created by a few people within the Bangladesh ecosystem who are leaders and pioneers, kind of building up the ecosystem from scratch long before I was ever there. And I was kind of, I kind of always knew them in parallel. And, you know, one of the things I, and there's also a, a company called Avishkar, which is from India, but they were looking to invest in Bangladesh as well. And they had seen how Indian angels and Mumbai angels and these angel networks around the region have been quite beneficial to the growth of their own ecosystem. So they felt that, hey, maybe a version of that makes sense for Bangladesh. And so they were willing to support the the concept. So yeah, they I, I, I found they were looking for somebody to kind of launch it. I joined at the pre-launch phase when it was kind of a website and a name and a logo, and they were looking to kind of get it started. So I, I joined at that time. And yeah, since then, you know, I've been the CEO. So that's that's kind of the journey with Bond the Angels so far. And uh, how, oh, go ahead. You, how does the network work and the, how do you create the value uh, for the entrepreneurs and also investors? Yeah, I think our val- value is very much, you know, I, I think in the US, for example, where it's a much more established uh, ecosystem. I think a lot of the role of angel networks is they're kind of like, you know, networking platforms, right? Both for entrepreneurs and with angels, right? Where they host events, they they do some screening, but they ultimately kind of the, their main kind of uh, value add is kind of matchmaking in a, a social setting or semi-social setting. Uh, for us, I think we have to go deeper because we're building the ecosystem from scratch, right? This angel ecosystem from scratch. So in many ways, we're almost like a merchant bank in the sense that on one hand, we have two constituencies, right? So on one hand, we have entrepreneurs who are typically first generation, but they're decided to become an entrepreneur. They're less than one or two years of operations. So we work with them on things like pitch decks and we work with them on things like financials and data rooms, right? Try to make them kind of investment ready, so to speak. And we do a lot of coaching around that. So that's one element. The second element is there's a lot of people who are angels or would be angels who are interested, but they don't know how to get started. And so they become members of Bangladesh Angels. They attend our events. They listen to our webinars and podcasts. They then get connected to these entrepreneurs. And we are in these conversations to try to you know, create, you know, syndicates of angels so that we do risking the investment for an individual angel rather than having to cut a hundred thousand dollar check. Maybe they could cut a ten thousand or twenty thousand dollar check, but do it with a few people together, right? That's as facilitated by Ban. And it's also good for the entrepreneur because rather than knocking on fifty doors, kind of Ban is doing that on your behalf, right? So at least in the initial stages, right? And you know, working side by side to kind of curate this angel group for you, structure the deal, do the documentation, etc. So that's kind of a big value addition is it bringing the parties together, but actually ma- making sure that they do a deal that's advantageous to both, kind of a win-win, right? We're sort of a new, uh, try to be a neutral arbiter between the two parties and then try to get the deal to close. So that's that's a big part of what we do. And we've done, you know, we've invested in 50 companies. We've done hundreds of transactions over the last five years. Um, so we've become very much like an investment bank for startups in Bangladesh. Uh, what types of founders and startups are you looking uh, to invest in? Yeah, I mean, I would say there's kind of three types, right? And I would say 90% kind of falls in the first type, which is companies that are from Bangladesh, that are solving for Bangladesh, that are trying to you know, use some kind of digital innovation, digital technologies um, to be able to automate and digitize more and more of the GDP, right? So that could be a health tech, that could be an ed tech, that could be an agri-tech, that could be a fintech. Etc. The the second constituent part could be, and we're open to this, and we'd love to do more. Uh, which is, it could be international startups that might be looking to come into Bangladesh, right? And because they see an opportunity, and and so we've done that in the past, and we're open to looking at that. And third, I think is more new, and it's come in kind of recent years, which is 
companies that are based out of, outside of Bangladesh, but they're often run by Bangladeshis with some kind of connection mm-hmm. back to Bangladesh. For example, they might have their software team there, right? But it's a SaaS company in the U.S. that's serving a U.S. Mm-hmm. clientele, right? Uh, but because we can mobilize a diaspora, so those are interesting deals for us as well. So, but all of that ultimately creates more economic. I mean, the aim is to create more economic value and bring innovation to Bangladesh as the economy grows. How do you source the deals and evaluate the startups uh, to invest in? Walk us through the process of due diligence. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the sourcing often comes from different channels, right? So we have almost, you know, 500 members in our network. So they often bring deals to us. That's one type. It could be inbound. You know, you know our emails are listed publicly. Uh, you know, we have forms you could fill out. Um, it could also be outbound, right? We, if we see somebody doing interesting things, you know, we'll often kind of get in touch with them and, and, and chat with them as well. In terms of the the process, so typically, you know, I have kind of three layers. So have analysts, have associates, and then obviously me. And so maybe it's usually the analyst taking the first calls. Um, if we like the, you know, what the entrepreneur is doing, we might ask them to work with us to kind of structure like a deal sheet. Uh, you know, essentially the beginning is an investment memo. And there's often a lot of back and forth on that. That could take a few, usually a few weeks up to maybe even, depending on, you know, how fast the entrepreneur wants to move, even could even take a few months. Uh, we have what's called quarterly showcases where we try to send a slate of deals to our membership. But through that, you know, that's often the work of you know dozens, if not almost hundreds of hours of work in making sure these deal sheets are as pristine and as detailed as possible. We're looking at your accounts. We're looking at your bank statements. You know, we are calling uh, customers on your list with, with your permission. We are, you know, getting in touch with other investors in the round, right? We might even do a field visit. Uh, we might even do a mystery shopping where one of our analysts will pretend to be a customer and, and try to use your product, right? We will download your app and, and test it out, right? Uh, we will look at other models in other markets and whether or not we can learn some lessons there. We might even look at other models in our local market and, and we'll see you know, what differentiates you. Uh, and we'll just have a lot of very robust conversations internally about you and, and, you know, what you're doing and whether or not like, we, we feel like, you know, we can kind of put our name and our efforts behind you to be able to raise money and, and take the mandate. Um, and then once we do decide to do that, then yeah, we'll share the deal flow to our network. And that itself is its own kind of screening process because it's not that, you know, hey, here's the deal, take it or leave it. You know, we'll often have, you know, we'll start whittle down 500 members, but then maybe 50 is very interested and they're on a call listening to the founder and maybe five or 10 are super interested and they become part of the syndicate. They're get, you know they're getting on their own calls with the founder. We're taking that insight. Some of them are subject matter experts. We're taking their insight and expertise. We are then putting it back into the investment memo, recirculating that again. And that process kind of depends. You know, It could be a few weeks up to maybe even sometimes a few months, depending on whether or not there's uh, it's always easier when uh, there's already kind of an anchor investor kind of setting the terms of the round because then, you know, it's easier to structure the deal. If not, we have to kind of structure it from scratch as well, including valuations and, in, in, you know, advising on valuations, advising on instruments and things like that. But yeah, we, we stay with the process until the, you know, the docs are signed and the money is in the bank and, you know, and we'll still stay on if the investors or the founders ask us to. Uh, depending on you know how much they want us to be involved, sometimes we even end up kind of being observers on board deals or, uh, or board meetings as well. So managing a, a business angel network is very difficult. What are some key challenges, especially a huge network of investors that you manage? Yeah, so I think the the the, the challenge is often the just the day to day kind of monetization, right? So it's a lot of work we put in. How do you get paid for that, right? I have to pay for a team, right? I have to pay for keeping the lights on, right? I have to pay for Zoom subscriptions and, you know, uh, you know, Microsoft and Google subscriptions too. So I think we have found a good equilibrium. So on one hand, our investors pay us an annual subscription uh, that pays for the team's time and OPEX. Uh, on the other hand, the companies, when they are successfully able to raise money from us, they uh, give us a success fee on funds raised. So that's how we started. Over the years, we've also evolved into sometimes running SPVs abroad with partners, and then we would take carries on those as well. But that's kind of more long term, right? And it's a bit more speculative. But I think those two revenue streams have kind of helped us to at least kind of scale. Like I've got a team of about, I would say about you know thirteen, fourteen folks now, um, and you know they're all in Bangladesh. But yeah, definitely, I think uh, you know it's it's been good for kind of scaling the team. I'll also add here, you know, we're structured as a what you might call like a not-for-profit company uh, or or not-for-loss, not for, uh, not-for-profit company in the sense that, you know, it's the company is owned by myself and my board. 
uh, these you know original founders of the company. But it, whatever money we make, it's always reinvested into running the company perpetually to serve more entrepreneurs in Bangladesh in the future, not necessarily for the benefit of one individual or a group of individuals, right? But that's definitely one. Second is just deal flow, right? You, I mean, you're only as good as your deal uh, or your last deal or the current deal you're working on. Uh, you know, we've had so many uh, places, uh, you know, um, situations where we spent dozens and dozens of hours and had so many discussions. And it's always frustrating at the very end. We're like, there's something here where like, we're missing something or we missed something or it's like, oh no, we can't go forward. Right. Um, and so that's always very frustrating, you know, also just, uh, and I think another challenge is obviously, as mentioned, you know, we've been running this for five years. Most of our investments are kind of average duration so far has been about two, two and a half. But I think it's, you know, at, we're at a stage now where a lot of investors are asking, hey, you know, when can the exit happen? And then we got to figure that out. Right. So that's also um, a challenge as well. How do you support and add value to your portfolio companies? Yeah, I think it's kind of a few ways. So one is, you know, we're, I, I think we have a very good kind of network into the corporate sector in Bangladesh, right? Through directors, owners, EOs. So I think, you know, we're often able to kind of facilitate those introductions, which I think is good. But I think our biggest value add is probably, you know, as companies grow, they're always looking for follow on capital, right? And so, you know, and once again, it's not a guaranteed, you know, we're always, look at you with fresh eyes and we'll treat you as a fresh deal. But obviously if there's existing trust there, it's a little bit easier. And so I think, yeah, providing, you know, providing access to fall on capital, potentially larger groups of funding from institutional sources. Another thing is, you know, often international VCs kind of ask us, Hey, what deals do you have? What companies do you have in your portfolio that looks good? Right. And that fit our criteria. So we often make those references as well. Um, so that's another big thing. And that's, you know, you a lot of success for us in our portfolio companies. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, I think 25% of our portfolio companies have raised follow-on funds since we came in. And I think the average growth in valuations, you know, on those follow-on rounds is about 4x, right? So that's good for the companies. That's good for the investors too. Hope, hopefully when they can realize some of that is exits. Um, so that's, those are some of the value that we bring. Are there enough active local investors? I mean, it's growing all the time, right? And I think that's also a big difference between when we started and, and now is you often see, uh, maybe before it was like a director at a large company cutting their own personal check into a startup. And the difference now maybe is maybe their, that, that director's son or daughter is now setting up a venture unit within their company and involving people from within the team and what having full-time full -time staff as well with the intent to then invest in more companies, right? Or kind of approach it systematically, right? And, and maybe they're, you know, potentially combine that with the asset management company that they own or the brokerage house they own with the intent to eventually start their own fund, for example. Right. So I think that's become very different from maybe before, as mentioned, like before it was often individuals doing it. Nowadays, we're seeing more institu institu institutionalization of venture capital within the local ecosystem. And I think that's good. Um, I think there's at least, you know, two dozen uh, people who've taken a venture, you know, venture capital license in Bangladesh uh, in institutions. And many of them have come to the market now with their own funds. So I think that's a that's a good thing. Uh, and hopefully that continues growing. The second is, yeah, I mean, this is something we've also had a hand in is, you know, um, more than 100 people cut their first ever angel checks through Bangladesh Angels, right? They weren't angels before, but they are now. And some of them have gone on to do more investments, you know, or start their own, have their own portfolio. So I think that's exciting. The other thing is also just the diaspora. You know, we have members of Bangladesh Angels in 24 different countries. I think, you know, at least 50 in unique cities. And these are often Bangladeshis who've started, who were born in Bangladesh, grew up there, but now have gone abroad and they're doing very well for themselves in sectors like finance and tech and even having their own businesses and they're investing back in Bangladesh as well. So I think from all three perspectives, like we've been able to be a part of the growth of the investor class in the country. Success stories, uh, recent years in Bangladesh, should you share a major success story, an exit or a growth so far? Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's been a few companies, like I think there's one company called Sunicorn, uh, that's a Sunicorn called ShopUp. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we've gotten to know the founders quite well. They're digitizing these mom and pop retail stores with access to inventory, access to finance and access to logistics. Uh, I think they, I think last I checked, they're generating like, you know, almost like a $400 million top line. They're looking at some international expansion as well, but I know they're, they're angel investors. Unfortunately, they started and they did their angel round before we even were in existence, right? But uh, I know many of their angel investors are part of our network, and I know they did a healthy, you know, double-digit kind of, you know, multiple 
on on some of their initial investments when they raised their uh, last rounds uh, maybe a year or two ago. So I think I think that's a that's a good one. Uh, there's definitely you know there's um, companies like uh, uh, I don't know if you've heard of a company called uh, Batal, which uh, is you know the largest kind of uh, mobility um, and you know. Uh, mobility and food delivery company in Bangladesh uh, and Nepal as well. But I know, you know, when they did their angel round and when some of those angel investors exited, I think they turned a healthy profit too. There's definitely a few examples like that. I think what we need is, you know, rather than a handful, I think what we need is dozens of examples like that, right? I think that's got to be the next kind of evolution of the ecosystem. And hopefully that happens soon. I think the successful founders will uh, continue to invest the startups. So this creates the network effect and uh, will solve the cold start problem. Because if you have uh, unicorns, that will create also a culture of unicorns. That's right. That's right. I think um, in, I've seen that, right? So a lot of, even before they exit, actually, like some of these founders, it, it's only natural, right? Uh, they're running these large businesses. They're accumulating some capital for themselves. You know, they are becoming angel investors. Uh, and I think that's exciting for sure. Absolutely. And what are the um, frequent mistakes that you see uh, the angels uh, uh, do while uh, ch- uh, writing their first checks? I, <laughs> I, I was talking about this with somebody, and it's interesting because this operates across markets, you know, but this person's in Dallas. And I think they made the point that, you know, like you, you shouldn't invest in like the country club deals. Right. And then say all startups in the sense that let's say you're doing you're going on a golfing, you know, you're, you're doing a weekend golfing. And that one of the people in the party is a friend of your you know, cousin and that person's starting a startup and you invest because of that. Right. Just kind of based on the relationship alone. Um, and then that company inevitably fails. And then you say, OK, well, with broad brush, OK, startup investing sucks. Right. Like, I think if you are going to do angel investing, I think you have to treat it as a sure, at least a hobby, uh, but even as a part time job where you're willing to allocate some time to it. You're willing to meet a lot of, you know, at least a, a few dozen founders, even before you decide, okay, this is the one or two that I'm going to invest in. You're willing to kind of build a portfolio over time, knowing that, you know, at least half will probably not return capital and it's the other half and maybe even one or two out of that portfolio. That's going to be the, become the household names one, you know, and will allow you to get the overall returns that are, you know, on, on a risk adjusted basis, probably better than anything else you could be investing in. Right. Um, I, I think it's, and yeah, maybe even being part of platforms like Bondless Angels, but not necessarily, you could be part of syndicates, right? You could sit at home now and, you know, go on angel list and listen to pitches, you know, from so many founders from around the world. Um, so I think that's probably the mistake is, oh, you know, just doing it informally, and that, you know, w- which has a high chance of being burnt. And then, kind of assuming, oh, it's just startup investing doesn't work. It can work. I think you just have to approach it in a certain way. What books or podcasts or other resources have you found most valuable recently? Yeah, you know, I I always try to devour like This Week in Startups. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, mm-hmm. Jason Calacanis and, and what he does is quite interesting. I think he gave a good kind of foundation. Um, I think, you know, I've really enjoyed the uh, the startup school kind of content from Y Combinator. And I think we've even taken some of that and kind of try to, you know, contextualize that in the context of Bangladesh and what we've seen as well as a team, right? Um, and we've shared that as well. So yeah, I think those are kind of two great con- pieces of content that's available, but there's so much, right? There's so much startup content out there. It's, mm-hmm. it's never ending, actually. Are there any local ones? Well, I might, you know, p- put a plug in for us. So we do have a pretty, you know, committed podcast. In fact, I'd love to have you on, Burak. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> you know, we- We'd love to learn about Turkey, but, you know, we, we try to do week, weekend webinars with people from around the world and we turn maybe, you know, every fourth or fifth one based on the content into a podcast that we put out. Uh, there's also a few of our friends have recently put out a, a new um, website focused on the Bangladesh startup ecosystem called Exit Stack. So I'm very excited about kind of following that uh, for sure. And there's one gentleman, uh, Ahmed Fahad. Uh, so he's the founder of Batal, uh, and he's got a great Bangla language podcast where you know all things kind of tech uh, and investing. And you know, I think I, I found that quite useful. So I'll share those links, and hopefully, we can kind of link those to uh, uh, for those watching as well. That will be great, Nijor. Thank you very much. It has been, in a nutshell, all the uh, uh, ecosystem summary uh, today in this episode. Awesome. No, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a, you know, it's wonderful to be able to tell our story, not just as band, but also uh, the Bangladesh startup ecosystem story. So, you know, thank you so much for having us and giving us a platform. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Burak.